thank you so much for joining today's uh, Vault 1.12 webinar. In this release, Vault adds a new Redis and AWS Elasticash Secrets Engine, a new PKCS 11 provider, improved the Transform Secrets Engine's usability, updated resource quotas, expanded PKI revocation and tele telemetry capabilities, and much more. Joining me today is Justin Weisig, a Senior Product Marketing Manager. During our session, we'll jump into our latest product features and then follow that up with the Q&A at the end. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone that registered uh, within one to two business days. You'll get an email in a couple of days with the link and then you can always go to our YouTube page as well to find the recording afterwards. And then if you do have questions, be sure to type them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll get to those at the end. With that, I'll turn it over to Justin. Hey, great, thanks Kaylee. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so today, today, as uh, Kaylee mentioned, we're gonna be talking about what went into Vault 1.12. And so um, uh, before we dive in, I thought it might make sense to quickly chat about um, you know, HashiCorp as a company. Uh, since you might not be familiar, maybe you're familiar with Vault or say Terraform. Um, so oftentimes folks think of us more as a, uh, you know, for our tools than they do for our company. But we have um, a variety of different projects, um, you know, Terraform, Vagrant, Packer, Vault. We just launched Boundary into GA, Console, Nomad, and Waypoint. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit, and we're obviously just going to focus on Vault, but um yeah, if, if you have uh, needs in these other areas, obviously um, explore those. So um, Vault, oh, sorry here. So Vault has sort of three main use cases. Um, the first is secrets management, which is sort of the concept of how do you actually store secrets? You know, sure, you're distributing secrets and, you know, sort of sensitive data um, throughout your infrastructure to your applications. But how do you actually manage the life cycle of those secrets? You know, how do you rotate them? Um, you know, how are they audited? Say there's a compromise somewhere. Can you actually say, hey, this secret led to this compromise? Um, the second is around sort of data protection. Actually, the sort of um, the second around is around dynamic secrets. So this concept is, um, uh, you know, you have short lived secrets. So they're sort of just in time secrets. Hey, I need a, a secret to, you know, maybe log into an AWS environment. I can generate a dynamic credential that, um, you know, will expire in a, a set amount of time, say one hour or eight hours. Um, you know, maybe I'm a, a developer. I need to go log into a, a particular uh, application to, you know, do some debugging, or maybe I'm a DBA and I need to log into a database. Hey, I need a credential for a short amount of time. What's really cool about dynamic credentials is that, you know, they really limit the window of where someone can, you know, grab one of those credential credentials and, and you know, possibly expose it. Um, the third use case is around, um, you know, data encryption and data protection. This is the idea of, you know, you have some middleware uh, that, um, you know, maybe it's an application and you need to do some data encryption or data uh, decryption. You know, you can offload those workloads to Vault um, uh, for that function. We'll chat it a little bit about it in a, in a bit here. One thing that's sort of interesting is, you know, what is a secret? You know, um, secrets we typically think of as, you know, authentication tokens or authorization, um, you know, tokens. You know, these are sort of classic examples of, you know, username and password to log into a database and API key for a cloud provider or, you know, a TLS certificate or something like that. You know, oftentimes these are hypersensitive things because, you know, they allow access into other systems. We also sort of wanted to uh, highlight, hey, there's a distinction between secret data and sensitive data. Sensitive data are, are, are things like social security numbers, credit cards, sort of PII data, right? These are this is data that, you know, um, a lot of organizations accumulate and they need to protect in some way, right? So Vault sort of serves both these use cases, um, you know, around secrets management and then uh, sensitive data around, you know, data encryption um, and advanced data protection. When you're sort of thinking of a secrets management solution, these are oftentimes some of the first questions that come up, you know, hey, how do I actually... Um, 
how do my applications get their secrets? You know, if I'm a, uh, I have an application and it's a, a storefront or something like that, you know, I'm going to be processing payments. I'm going to be sending emails. I'm going to need to connect to some sort of data store for, you know, customer records. All of a sudden you're talking about a bunch of credentials, uh, you know, some of them highly privileged if you're going to a, a payment processor or something like that. Um, you know, how do humans acquire secrets? Hey, I, I'm a, a developer or, you know, some sort of sysadmin. I need to log into one of these systems. Uh, you know, how do I get the credentials to do that? How is the life cycle sort of managed? All that kind of stuff, right? This kind of comes to the concept of identity brokering with Vault. Um, so I, I don't think I mentioned it before, but um, in this slide here, you know, Vault's a central tool that you put onto your network. And, you know, it's a highly available, typically a highly available cluster running, say, multiple instances of Vault. And um, it can be run in a highly available way. And it's a central place where you can put, you know, um, your secret data or sensitive credentials and also, you know, interact with it to, you know, do data encryption and decryption. What this typically does is, you know, it limits the sort of secret sprawl that you might see throughout your infrastructure. Hey, I have uh, secrets stashed away in, uh, you know, config files. Um, some of it, um, you know, is checked into version control. Maybe it's sitting in an Excel file or something like that. If you uh, put your secrets into Vault, then you have a centralized place. What's really cool about this is you have a centralized workflow, right? Now you have multiple teams that you can say, hey, here's how you interact with Vault. Here's how you perform these, uh, you know, setting a secret, getting a secret and stuff like that versus, you know, each team sort of rolling their own uh, capability. So, yeah, great. We we put all our secrets in the central place, but how I still need a username and password to actually access Vault and get my secrets out of there. So this is where the a pretty cool concept of um, identity brokering comes from, in that, you know, Vault has the capability of interacting with the underlying platform that's actually running your application. So say, for example, you're running an application in Kubernetes. Vault has an integration with Kubernetes where you can associate, you know, your application service account and use that as a form of identity. And you can link that to Vault to say, hey, this Kubernetes service account has access to these secrets. Um, so your application doesn't even need to have a username and password to connect to Vault since it has that link to the underlying platform. Um, you know, that's just one example, but, you know, we have integrations with, uh, you know, pretty much all uh, major, you know, auth providers and, uh, you know, cloud platforms, whether you're running in, you know, AWS, Azure, or GCP, um, even on-prem uh, systems too. Uh, this kind of gets into, hey, we have a lot of integrations. Yeah, we have a lot of integrations for auth plugins, as well as um, something we call secrets engines, which you can sort of think of as uh, plugins too. So, you know, this serves use cases like, hey, I have a database and I need to rotate a credential in it, um, uh, sort of things like that. Also dynamic credentials, which we chatted about earlier. Um, I just uh, put this diagram in to sort of maybe illustrate it a little bit. So you have Vault sitting here, centralized uh, service that uh, you have lots of your secret data in. We have auth plugins. Uh, uh, I think last count, there's over 30 of them. So these tie into your underlying platforms. Um, and you can sort of associate your application's identity uh, so that you don't need to provide a username and password to fetch uh, secrets out of Vault. It's authenticated with the underlying platform. And then on sort of the right-hand side here, we have uh, something called secret engines. We have a, a wide range of integrations with all sorts of platforms of, hey, I need to generate a, you know, a short-lived dy dynamic credential. Hey, I want to connect to this external um, you know, Postgres database and rotate a credential or something like that. You know, those are sort of uh, the use cases that are covered there. Everything's API driven. So you have um, the capability of automating all this. Um, in fact, that's the primary use case of how people interact with Vault is, um, you know, through automation, through the API. So machine to machine access. Obviously, we have CLI tools, uh, the APIs there, as well as a web UI. And there's sort of three different ways you can run it. We have the open source um, version of Vault, which is um, uh, a very popular uh, GitHub project. Uh, and it really drives sort of the pace of innovation and in that, um, hey, if you uh, have a use case, you can um, go in there and 
um, you know, suggest it. And if you have a, you know, something you want to change, you can just do it. We also have an enterprise version of Vault. This is where, hey, you know, you have more advanced use cases. Um, you know, I'm a, a large organization with, you know, hundreds of thousands of secrets, and I need a way to replicate those secrets across the country. That, that's the sort of use cases that are in the enterprise version. We also have a managed cloud offering. So you just click a button and it'll spin up a managed instance of Vault, a highly available instance, and, um, you know, HashiCorp will manage it for you. So you don't have the ops overhead of, you know, running it yourself. Cool. So that was my sort of brief introduction of, um, you know, Vault 101. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, feel free to just uh, pop it in the QA box and I'll get to it at the end. So at this section, we're going to chat about um, Vault 1.12 and when it went into the release. So I have a, what I'm going to do is I have three links, sort of the, the, uh, I guess maybe I'll say, you know, if you're watching this live right now, I'll, I'll pop the links into the uh, chat box here. However, if you're watching this in the future on um, uh, YouTube or something like that, just make sure you check the description below and I'll, I'll make sure all these links are in there too. So I'm going to paste the... Um, Sorry, chat's not working for me for a second here. Okay. Uh, one sec, I just need to minimize this. Okay, perfect. So there's a blog post that went out, um, you know, HashiCorp Vaults uh, 1.12. It has all the uh, links to the resources and everything that um, you'll need to, uh, I guess, follow along or, you know, you don't have to listen to me explain it. You can just go read for yourself. It has all the links and, uh, you know, details in there. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, one of the main focuses for this release is, you know, obviously broadening the e ecosystem of plugins. You know, there's pretty much everything that you're going to see today is driven by you know, uh, basically the folks on the call are, uh, you know, the users of Vault of, hey, you know, hey, I have this problem. Uh, uh, can we get this fixed? Or, hey, I have this use case. Can uh, Vault, uh, you know, add this capability? So those are, um, you know, we're always trying to broaden the ecosystem and sort of sand off the rough edges on any, um, you know, integrations. Uh, also, reliability and ease of use. You know, you'll see a lot of improvements around um, hey, we have this use case, but we need better debugging or, hey, I need, uh, you know, better telemetry, um, that kind of stuff. Also, there's a big focus in this release on, um, you know, adding capability to the advanced data protection module. This is where, um, you know, we sort of talked about sensitive data at the beginning. Um, you know, my organization has a lot of, uh, you know, PII data. I need a way to protect that. We've really enhanced the capabilities around that and we'll chat about it. So here's a brief overview. I'll, start, I'll dive deep on a few of these. Uh, we've added uh, the ability to have version plugins. Um, we've added, we've updated sort of enhanced resource quota support. Um, we've added uh, PKI telemetry. We added a new Redis secret engine, as well as um, an AWS Elastic Cache uh, engine. We've added a new LDAP engine sort of a unified, uh, we basically took the existing LDAP, open LDAP engine and Active Directory engine and merged it into a single N uh, LDAP engine just to make the use case much easier. You know, you don't have to go to, you know, one particular um, engine over the other. Now you can just have one that has a sort of unified uh, feature set. We've updated the um, Terraform provider and uh, much more. I'll sort of deep dive into some of this stuff and uh, show you a few demos and examples. Actually, I should mention this is just on the open source side, and then um, we'll have a section that covers that enterprise stuff. So pretty cool one here is, um, you know, we added version plugins. So the problem before was that um, basically we didn't have versioning on plugins. Well, we did, but it was, um, you know, around uh, the hashes of the plugin. And so it didn't make the user experience um, um, that great in that, hey, you need to track down the, 
the hashes of these particular plugins. Um, now we've added the concept of you know versioning to the plugin so that uh, a plugin can be version aware and it sort of enables a standardized experience across um, you know the plugin ecosystem. So what I wanted to do is I'll show you a brief demo of that. Great. So here I'm running uh, latest version of Vault. As uh, long as my Vault server is up and running, um, so it's pretty easy. Like, um, so it's a Vault plugin on the list, and now you can see. Um, so before we basically didn't have these uh, version numbers over here. So what's really cool about this now is that uh, it gives you the ability to sort of manage the life cycle of a plugin. You can also add multiple versions of a plugin. So say, for example, you have a AWS plugin. Um, you can add uh, the previous version. So you could actually have multiple versions. And, um, you know, say you encountered a bug with the latest one, you could refer to the uh, previous one. And it gives you a, a, a much better sense of the plugin version that you're running since, hey, you have a sort of a human readable version versus the SHA. 256 uh, hash of it. So that's pretty cool. Let me uh, go back to the slides. I'm just going to exit out of the presentation here for a sec. So over here, we have the um, docs for it. So basically, you can see um, you can also, you know, we just ran vault plugin list, uh, but you can also add things like secrets. Um, that'll uh, sort of narrow down the criteria of what you're looking for. You know, here's how you can, um, you know, register a plugin, you, still using the hash, obviously. Um, I think there's also a tutorial in here. Um, if you go to tutorials, there's a new um, uh, Vault 1.12 release. Um, this has all the tutorials that, um, you know, basically go through um, what happened in this release. Um, so we'll go back here. Next one I want to chat about is uh, resource quotas. So maybe I'll just give a brief uh, resource quota refresher. Um, you know, we originally added resource quotas as a way to protect Vault from bad actors. This might, this isn't necessarily, you know, external people that are accessing your your Vault cluster or something. It's more of um, well, it covers sort of both those use cases, but, you know, say you had an external entity or maybe an internal team that wrote some bad code and maybe it's, um, you know, hitting vaults too much, you know, uh, resource quotas is a way to sort of limit um, the amount of requests per second uh, that a particular application has access to. And so basically you'll set a resource quota and you'll say, hey, you know, um, on this particular path, I, I don't want it to exceed, um, you know, two requests per second or something like that. Obviously, that's very low, but you, you sort of get the idea. Um, so the problem, uh, resource quotas are widely used, but uh, this, there's sort of a problem in that, um, you know, folks needed tighter controls that go beyond just global namespace and mount. And so what we've at, we've added the capability for resource quotas to support, um, you know, path paths as well as sort of wildcard paths and auth mounts. So I'll give you a brief uh, demo of what that looks like too. So um, I'm just gonna do some copy and, and pasting here since uh, you know it's probably not worth your time to watch me uh, type this out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm, I'm, oops, I'm gonna write a, I'm going to write a quota to the rate limit um, uh, to the resource quota rate limiter. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm just going to call it a global uh, rate limit. Um, and I'm going to say, hey, I want to set a rate limit of uh, two requests. And then I'm going to say two requests over 10 seconds. And so what we sort of expect to see is, um, hey, two requests will go through. And then if there's a third request within those 10 seconds, then, hey, we should get an error, right? So I'm going to do that. Then I'll say vault namespace list. 
hey, we got a, a, a proper reply. This one should error out since we're giving, uh, yeah, great. So you can see, hey, there was an API error and we exceeded uh, the quota. Yeah, that's cool. Um, however, you know, uh, folks want uh, greater granularity. So let me, um, I'll just copy something here and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. So say, for example, you wanted to create, um, you know, a rate limit on, you know, auth token create, um, you know, or you want to say, hey, I want to have a, a rate limit on auth token create and, you know, sort of auth or, or fan, but, um, you know, you don't want to uh, rate limit um, lookup. So before this, we didn't actually have the capability of sort of adding wild cards in here to say, hey, on this particular path, um, uh, I want you to rate limit. So I'll, I'll just copy this new command here and I'll explain what it does. So this one here is, um, you know, we're writing a, a new rate limit. We're saying, hey, you know, I, I want to rate a rate limit uh, with a path. I'm saying, um, you know, I'm, we're doing the same thing again. Hey, hey I want to make two requests. Uh, this time I'm just doing an interval of one minute just so that the demo works here. Obviously, in reality, these rate limits are going to be quite a bit higher and you're probably not going to do it over, you know, one minute or something like that, but uh, you get the idea. And, and this is the new capability that we added with uh, 1.12. So now you can specify a path and you can say, hey, I want to set a rate limit on auth token create uh, star. Um, so this will cover our use case of we're going to rate limit the um, you know, auth token create and auth token orphan uh, commands, but we're not going to um, you know, rate limit anything outside of that. So I'm going to set that one. And then let's uh, just gonna copy some commands here. So we'll do that one. And then uh, orphan should also work. Great. If I do this again, we, we should uh, be blocked, right? So we exceeded the quota. Um, same thing if I do uh, uh, create, great. However, if I do something like um, look up solve, that uh, succeeds. So. I know this uh, probably demo seems fairly simple, but uh, it adds a, a pretty cool capability in that uh, you have much more uh, granularity in um, uh, sort of the resource uh, rate limits that you set. We'll go back to the um, deck. Actually, I'm just going to uh, go out of here for a second. So um, we have a, a really cool learn guide uh, that talks about um, you know resource quotas sort of in depth. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty cool site. It's called learn.hashicorp.com that has, I think, hundreds of hands-on labs. You know, it's totally free. You can just go in there. And these are tutorials that'll uh, explain what the feature is. And then it gives you sort of a deep dive of how to set up the environment, um, you know, how to connect the vault, and then basically how to go through and, um, you know, set up the quotas on your own uh, so that you, you can play around with the basically same demo I just showed you. Also, it teaches you sort of in depth about uh, the feature. So uh, really cool uh, way to learn. All right, so that's uh, resource quotas. Uh, PKI telemetry. Um, so I don't have a demo for this one, but I wanted to chat about the use case a little bit. So PKI is used real, uh, you know, heavily at scale at a lot of companies where you know they they might be using uh, it to generate uh, certificates to you know uh, verify the identity of one service talking to another, or they're using it as their um, you know internal PKI you know sort of source of truth. Uh, however, uh, you know we had some customer feedback that uh, we'd like a little bit more knobs or, you know, metrics coming out of the PKI engine so that, um, you know, uh, when we're trying to debug, um, you know, performance issues or trying to figure out, hey, where bottlenecks are, um, that, uh, you know, maybe we could bubble those up out of Vault. And so we've added that capability um, in Vault 1.12. So I'll just go over to, um, uh, we have a telemetry page here. Um, I'm just going to search for PKI because there's a lot of metrics. 
Um, yeah, so we added a bunch of new metrics here, uh, basically gauges and counters. So if you're using the PKI engine, um, chances are this is going to come in really handy. And then you can just plug it into your existing uh, metrics pipeline. I should also mention that, hey, all this stuff comes uh, from customers customer requests or you know user requests so uh that's really important to someone I'm sure all right so that's the PKI engine next one I want to cover is um we added a Redis database uh, secrets engine this is actually a, a contribution from uh uh from the open source side so you know thanks very much uh, for that so this sort of the use case here is hey I have a Redis instance running um but I want to, you know, typically you'll have long-standing root credentials, or you might have accounts that are long-standing. What I mean by long-standing is basically you set up a root account with a username and password, and you never change that uh, password, right? That's obviously a bit of a vulnerability if, um, you know, that password ever gets leaked. So uh, Vault has the capability through something called, um, you know, a database secret engine. It has a bunch of different plugins for all sorts of databases where uh, Vault can actually establish a connection out to the uh, database, say, you know, in this instance, Redis or Postgres or MS SQL or whatever, and it can rotate their root credentials. Uh, it can also uh, create static credentials. So say, hey, I need a, a short-lived uh, account on Redis to do some work. Uh, Vault can actually generate that um, credential for you and pass it back to you. And then Vault will uh, look after tidying up that credential after the after it expires. So um, this new secret engine, um, you know, adds the capability of uh, generating stynet, uh, static and dynamic user accounts, uh, as well as, um, you know, rotating the root credential or standalone uh, credentials. So uh, really cool capability. And, um, you know, if you're using Redis uh, and you, you want to protect it a little bit more, this is a great way to do it. Just jump out and um, uh, show you the doc. So uh, here's the uh, Redis database secret engine. Um, you know, it says, hey, we can uh, rotate the root credential, dynamic credentials, and static roles. Again, the docs are really good on this one. Um, basically shows you how to set it up, how to configure everything, um, and then how to basically generate dynamic credentials, um, uh, static roles, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you're using uh, Redis with Vault, uh, definitely check that out. I should also mention that. Um, uh, you know, all the slides here uh, will be, uh, I guess, provided as well as the recording after. So if you need any of the links, uh, you'll have it all. So in addition to the Redis secret engine, we also added a Amazon Elastic Cache secret engine. Um, this has the ability of um, um, basically the same use case. Hey, I have longstanding credentials. Uh, what do I do about it? Um, so this secret engine, uh, you know, has the ability to generate, um, you know, static credentials uh, for an existing managed instance. So, hey, um, uh, I need to do some work on the uh, Elastic Cache instance. Hey, uh, Vault generate me a credential. Uh, same use case there. Maybe I'll just show you the docs real quick if uh, you're interested in that. So basically, you can't do uh, root credential or dynamic uh, credentials with this one. This one is just um, uh, static roles. I imagine this is something we'll explore in the future, but uh, the initial version doesn't have it. Same thing, uh, walks you through how setting it up and all that stuff. <clears throat> this isn't uh, vault specific to like uh, 1.12, um, you know, we do have a Terraform provider that uh, you know is maintained outside of uh, sort of the light, sort of the cadence that we release Vault, but I, I wanted to throw this in here because I know a lot of uh, people are using it. So, uh, sort of the problem was that um, you know the Vault provider didn't know which version of Vault you were running. So, as a you know, I guess a Terraform uh, you know DevOps person, you're in there doing your um, your your Terraform config using the uh, provider. Uh, However, you need to be aware of what version of, of Vault you're running. So you need, you know, what capabilities that you can turn on and off or what features were released in that release. This is obviously cumbersome and, you know, added a bunch of uh, additional work for, for those folks. So the solution here is that um, 
we made the Terraform provider vault aware. So it'll actually reach out to the vault server and say, hey, what version are you running? And then uh, the Terraform provider now knows what features to unlock. Uh, so that's pretty cool if you're using the provider. Uh, it's obviously great. Um, yeah, the docs uh, go into detail if you're uh, looking at any of that stuff. Also, the blog has all the docs there. I sort of I mentioned this, uh, you know, briefly at the top, in that um, you know originally we had, um, well, we still have the Active Directory uh, uh, secret engine as well as the Open LDAP uh, secret engine. However, we merged these into something called the LDAP secret engine, and the reason why is that um, it was quite cumbersome if you're using LDAP and you're not sure, hey, which secret engine do I actually use? And they didn't have, you know, feature parity. So what we've done is we've merged them into something called the LDAP secret engine. Uh, now you can sort of choose, hey, I want to uh, turn on the capability of, um, you know, AD, or I want to turn on the capability of uh, just LDAP. And then, um, you know, it gives, gives you a much tighter... Um, sort of loop for configuring it versus, um, you know, going down one path and then figuring out, oh, hey, I need to go down another. Um, we've added extensive documentation here, as well as um, sort of renamed the LDAP secret engine into uh, just the LDAP secret engine or open LDAP into LDAP. Um, gives you all the, conf basically how you set it up and everything like that. Great. So that covers all the, the open source piece. I wanted to sort of jump into the enterprise side of things now. Um, so we added extensive capability um, around the Transform Secret Engine, as well as, um, you know, PKI. Probably the big, big headline feature here for this release is uh, PKI, PKCS11 support uh, as a provider. So, you know, Vault can act as a, a PKCS11 uh, server. So if you have... Um, uh, you know, a client that, uh, you know, connects out to uh, one of those servers, uh, Vault can now do that. But obviously, there's some uh, limitations to that, and we'll kind of cover it in uh, the next section here. You know, we don't cover the full spectrum of features. Uh, you know, this is an initial pass. Also, we've um, extended ex extended uh, sort of the capabilities, the KMIP uh, secret engine. Um, Around uh, transfer secret engine, we added the ability to bring your own key. Uh, we added MS SQL support. So if you want to store you know, tokens in a MS SQL server, you can do that. Uh, we've also added the ability to um, you know, uh, automate um, you know, encryption key rotation. Um, I'll deep dive into each one of these, so I don't want to uh, go too deep into it right now. I should also mention, hey, if you have any questions, uh, we'll cover it at the end. Just make sure you uh, pop it into the QA box there and I'll, I'll answer it. Um, so the big one here is, um, you know, uh, PKCS 11 support. So, you know, Vault Enterprise uh, 1.2 adds this, adds a PKCS 11 2.4 compliant provider, um, you know, with the expanded profile sort of the, um, this is sort of the standard protocol supported by HSMs. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you have an application and it needs, um, you know, certificates, oftentimes you're going to need to perform, you know, things like key generation, hashing, encryption, decryption, and signing. Obviously, Vault didn't have that capability before this release. Um, so we wanted to add, add this capability. And it's, um, you know, something that we're looking to expand upon. I will also mention that, um, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, Oracle database encryption in a second here. Um, that that was a dependency on this feature here. So the, this feature is going to unlock a bunch of additional capabilities as we uh, start to flush it out. Um, so we talked about resource quotas. So we have the, uh, the provider page here goes into a ton of uh, details about, um, you know, the platforms that are supported, um, you know, quick start guides on how to actually set it up, um, you know, and get it running. I think in here, there's also, uh, um, it lists out all the capabilities. So, hey, if, um, you know, your client has a particular capability that you're looking for, you can actually go in here and map it out. Obviously, we're looking to flush, um, you know, some of these uh, capabilities out.
Great. Uh, so the KMAP secret engine, I'll, I'll briefly chat about this use case here for a second. So say, for example, you have um, a bunch of um, uh, sort of storage appliances. You know, maybe you're using a NetApp file or using VMware or something like that. Oftentimes, you know, you'll hear the phrase, hey, we protect data at rest and in transit. So folks are protecting data at transit using, you know, TLS, HTTPS encryption. How are they actually protecting data at rest? Well, oftentimes they're encrypting the, the you know, physical disks. Um, and so how that typically works is, hey, hey, you know, your appliance will support encryption and decryption, but you're going to need to manage those keys somehow, right? So I'm going to need to manage those encryption keys. And typically in a large organization, you're not talking about, you know, one NetApp file or something like that. You're typically talking about a lot of them, right? So all of a sudden it becomes um, a bit of a, a management problem on the key side of, okay, I have all these encryption keys. How do I make sure that, um, you know, I have a sense of all the keys? Uh, how do I manage the life cycle of them and that kind of stuff? So this is where the KMAP uh, secret engine comes into play. It adds the capability of, um, you know, storing those keys in Vault and having uh, Vault act as, a, a, you know, a centralized server for it. And basically, this KMIP protocol uh, is a server that um, uh, Vault has. So, um, you know, initially when we rolled this out, um, we we had a, you know, sort of a, a standard feature set. But, um, you know, with this release, we flushed out a lot of those capabilities, sort of like we were talking about PKCS11 a second ago. Um, you know, we're continuing to add. Uh, so we uh, added baseline server profile in addition to, um, you know, the other capabilities here. Um, great. So, okay, we're going to jump to um, transform now. So, um, I, I chatted a, a minute ago about C PKCS 11. So uh, that feature unlocks additional use cases. So uh, say, for example, you're uh, running an Oracle database server and you actually want to encrypt, uh, you know, the, the data that's in, in that database. Um, Vault can now, uh, you know, store the keys that will actually allow you to do that. So, you know, um, You'll download a special library. You'll install it on your uh, Oracle database uh, server, and then that'll allow you to interact with Vault to, you know, sort of uh, fetch the keys for doing that data encryption. You know, we have docs on on that use case if um, you're looking to do that. So I have three features here on the Transform Secret Engine. So the Transform Secret Engine, the use case here, uh, goes back to what we chatted about at the very beginning, in that. Um, Hey, I have a bunch of sensitive data. You know, maybe I'm a large hotel or an insurance provider. I'm I'm dealing with people's bank accounts. I have their passport numbers. I have their driver's license, address, date of birth, all that stuff, right? You know, maybe a few of those pieces on their own aren't that uh, you know sensitive. But when you bundle all that together, all of a sudden it's very sensitive, right? Um, so the Transform Secret Engine is designed around the use case of I want to um, you know encrypt data or tokenized data that's sitting in a database or a database or a data warehouse somewhere, right? Um, so that even if uh, someone breaks into my infrastructure and they manage to download my database, um, they don't actually have access to the raw, un, uh, you know, unencrypted data. So that's what the Transform Secret Engine, uh, that's the use case that it targets. So we've uh, uh, expanded the capability in this one, you know, to bring your own keys. So say, for example, um, your organization has a HSM and you generated some encryption keys on there, and then all of a sudden you want to import them into Vault. Um, you can now, we now have that capability to do that. <clears throat> the next one here is, um, you know, obviously it's a best practice to rotate uh, encryption keys. Um, we didn't have an automated way of doing that in uh, Transform. So what we've done is we've uh, flushed out that capability to, you know, automatically rotate um, the Transform encryption keys. and. Uh, provided, um, you know, configuration within Vault uh, for how you can set that up. Last one I wanted to chat about on uh, Transform Secret Engine is that, um, so when we're talking about tokenization, uh, maybe I'll briefly explain what tokenization is. So, hey, I'm a hotel chain again. I Someone gives me their credit card number. I'm actually storing that credit card number, you know, uh, 
you know, maybe I'm not using a third party provider. Maybe I'm actually storing that credit card uh, in, in our infrastructure somewhere. Um, I don't actually want to store the raw credit card, right? I, I want to, Vault has the capability of generating a token, looks something like a hash, um, but it, it has, it, it can't be unencrypted. Uh, it, it's only a one way, uh, you know, hash. And so, what we need to do is store that mapping in a database somewhere of, hey, this credit card belongs to this token. And so for a long time, we've supported uh, MySQL and Postgres for that use case. And we've added the capability of adding MS SQL as an external data store. So if you're um, you know, running a, a Microsoft infrastructure, uh, you can now support that. Um, the last one I wanted to cover here is, um, um, so say you're managing, um, you know, encryption keys out in a cloud provider. Um, you know, maybe you're doing things like, uh, you know, certificate signing or something like that. Uh, for a long time, we've, well, not for, I think for a few releases, we've supported, um, you know, uh, AWS and Azure, um, uh, you know, being able to manage those keys. Uh, we've added the capability for, um, you know, GCP KMS. So that just sort of rounds out the the, the providers that we uh, support there, or uh, cloud providers. I will mention that um, uh, that's also covered in here. If if you have the capability of, um, you know, hey, we're managing keys in a, a cloud provider KMS, and I want to, um, you know, use Vault to sort of manage them, uh, here's where you learn about that. All right, so that covers everything I wanted to chat about. Um, there are a few links here. Um, the The big one is obviously the blog post uh, as well as learn.hashicorp.com. This has all the sort of hands-on tutorials about everything that went into the release, as well as, you know, sort of our core use cases that um, you'll see in Vault. Uh, so those are really valuable links. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump over to uh, the Q&A. If you have any other questions, uh, just pop them in there and we'll go through it. Um, sorry, there might be a, a second or two here while I, uh, you know, read through some of these. So just uh, bear with me. Um, so there's a question in here. Hey, I'd, I'd love to learn about the, the web UI. Um, you know, uh, basically, how can I do that? Uh, so what I'll, maybe I'll just uh, show you quickly what it looks like. Uh, let me share my screen. I'm going to go over here. Just going to cancel this for a second. So, you know, I added those uh, rate limits. So if I show you the uh, web UI, it's probably going to uh, uh, complain. So. Um, Vault has the capability of, um, you know, running a server in dev mode. So you just run Vault uh, server dev, um, and basically gives you like a default instance that hey, you can go uh, connect to and do stuff. So um, you'll have the uh, this is the API address, but you can also connect to it. Um, what am I doing here? I'm going to copy that, and then uh, I'll go back here and I'll just show you what the UI looks like. Um, so I can open a new tab, go to it. Oops, actually, I need to grab the token. Well, maybe this is good so you can see uh, how you'd actually do it. So, um, uh, you know, when you run Vault, you'll be given something called a root token. This basically is, um, you know, hey, your root password for logging into it. Uh, from there, you can go and uh, configure it, right? So I'm going to uh, go to there. I'm going to go back to the Vault uh, UI. I'm going to enter that. So basically, this is the uh, UI. So you see here, we have something called secret engines. Um, you can go in here, um, you know, hey, I want to create a new secret. Uh, you can do that kind of stuff. Oops. Yeah. Uh, you can also enable secrets engine. So we chatted about, you know, the extensive... Uh, sort of uh, ecosystem of secret engine as well as auth plugins. So secrets engines are typically things of, hey, I want to reach, I want to store secrets or maybe I want to reach out to an external system and do something. So 
you know, maybe I want to um, uh, reach out to AWS or GCP or Azure. I want to generate some dynamic secrets. You can, you know, go and enable that. Um, you know, maybe I want to uh, enable the Redis secret engine that we chatted about. Uh, you can go do that. We also have things called um, auth methods. So this is where, uh, hey, I have a, a platform. I'm running on uh, Kubernetes. I want to, uh, you know, establish a, a sort of a, a link of trust between my Kubernetes cluster and Vault, so that, you know, when I have an application, it doesn't need to, uh, you know, call into Vault. Um, you can go and configure all this stuff right, right through the web UI. Uh, so we also have um, something on uh, learn learn.hashicorp.com. If you scroll down here to Vault, there's a whole section on uh, called getting started with the UI. These are hands-on labs, uh, eight tutorials that typically, you know, they're like eight minutes, five minutes, four minutes. It basically shows you Hey, how do I spin up a vault cluster? How do I get uh, you know familiarized with the UI? How do I create a secret? How do I uh, you know basically bootstrap the cluster? So those are really good uh, resources if uh, you're looking to get started there. So I'm going to answer that one. Uh, thanks for the question, Jeff. Um, so Robin asks, um, hey, is the current LDAP secret engine still available? Yeah, it's still available. Basically, what we did is we just renamed the open LDAP secret engine into the LDAP secret engine. So um, it, it's still the same underlying code, except, um, you know, we've merged um, uh, those two together. I think eventually in the future, uh, there might be a deprecation, but like, I don't think that's coming anytime soon. So uh, I... I you know, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, yeah, all the docs, I think, have been, uh, you know, linked over to uh, instead of or renamed open LDAP over to just LDAP. So uh, that's what happened there. So you can still use it. It's basically the same thing, except it's just uh, merged. It's really a, a, you know, sort of a, a, I don't know, a quality of life improvement. If you're using one of those engines of, hey, uh, you know, I need this feature that's in, uh, you know, the AD um, LDAP engine, but uh, I'm, I'm using the open LDAP engine. So, you know, uh, merging them together gives us greater flexibility to make sure that we have feature parity across that stuff. Um, there's another question here. Um, sorry, I'm just going to read it. It's a bit uh, long. Yeah, so this is sort of around the um, uh, uh, Terraform provider for Vault. Um, I think it sort of goes into, hey, there's some issues in the Terraform provider uh, GitHub repo that, uh, you know, I need basically longstanding issues that, um, you know, maybe it doesn't support or I, I need help with. Honestly, I'm not the best person to answer that. I don't, uh, you know, manage the plugin or whatever. Um, this is an anonymous uh, one, but if you're more than happy to reach out to us, like if you want to um, uh, maybe submit the question again, uh, so we can have your email and then I'll get the team um, for the vault uh, Terraform provider to reach out to you and you can uh, chat with them about it. Uh, thanks for the question. Sorry, I wasn't uh, able to answer it there. Um, there's a, a question here from Craig that says, hey, I'm curious if uh, Vault uh, can support one-time passwords. Yeah, so we have something called uh, Login MFA. Uh, it has uh, the capability of uh, using one-time passwords. I think it depends on your use case. Like that's primarily for, hey, I'm, I want to limit the capability or, uh, um, uh, hey, I want to log into Vault and I need a, like a dual MFA uh, sort of token one-time password thing. So that's the use case. I'm not sure of the use case you're thinking about, but um, the feature is called login MFA. So um, uh, vault login MFA. Um, you, so there's a tutorial here. Uh, I think there's, there's an auth method called uh, login MFA um, and it supports um, you know one-time passwords, Okta, dual and ping ID. And then uh, there's a little tutorial here that uh, walks you through how to set it up. So um, 
if that's your use case, hopefully that'll uh, solve it for you. Um, great, thanks for uh, uh, sending in your uh, uh, name there. I'll get the uh, Terraform provider folks to reach out to you. So there's a couple more questions. Um, So um, hey, if you're not using uh, dynamic secrets yet, how would you go about um, setting up password rotation on a predetermined cycle? Yeah, so um, uh, dynamic secrets and um, you know secret rotation are uh, sort of different use cases. So maybe I'll just quickly chat about it. So uh, the use case for dynamic secrets. So static secrets are, hey, I have a, a set username and password. I'm going to put them in Vault, and they're not going to change. Uh, a dynamic credential, the use case is the secret doesn't exist yet. It, do, it, it, it doesn't exist till I ask for it. So I might be, um, you know, a AWS sysadmin, and I need to access, um, you know, some uh, machine in there. Um, you know, we'll set up the AWS secret engine with Vault so that Vault has the capability of, like, interacting with AWS. IAM through um, you know your API keys. So the the use case for dynamic credentials is that you make a request to Vault to say, hey, generate me a credential, a brand new one uh, that might be available for eight hours or something like that, and Vault will pass the credential back to you. So that's uh, uh, dynamic secrets. And then you know after those eight hours are up, Vault will go back to AWS and blow away that credential. So um, so password rotation. Uh, say for something like uh, Redis is using a, a, a totally different secret engine. So it's called, um, you know, the database secret engine. Um, and there's sort of support for all the major uh, databases in there. And this is sort of a, a process that Vault handles where, again, you'll set up a, a link between Vault and your database where, you know, you'll give it credentials to log into the database. And then Vault uh, basically through config, uh, config, you can say, hey, every 30 days, I want you to go run this SQL command on this database uh, to, to you know, rotate this credential. So um, yeah, you don't have to be using dynamic credentials or anything like that to use password rotation. They're totally different. Um, if you want to learn about that, you can go to documents. Uh, where is it? Uh, Project. Let's go to the docs. Um, we just rolled out a new uh, a version of the website, so I apologize. I'm still uh, learning where everything is. Uh, let's search for it. Data. Yeah, okay. So here's a database secret engine. Um, and then in here, it should give you a list of all the databases that we uh, uh, provide. So basically, this sort of gives you an example of what it might look like. Hey, I, I this is creating a static, uh, you know, role or something like that. But uh, generally, you'll configure the, um, you know, uh, password rotation, and it'll have some sort of SQL command in there. We give you templates for all that stuff to say, hey, uh, you know, go and um, uh, update this password with a new password and vault to store it. Uh, so I'm going to answer this one. Thanks for the question there, Jeff. Hopefully that answers it. Um, so for uh, AWS KMS, uh, where you bring your own key, uh, yeah, you can manage the lifecycle of those keys. However, that's an enterprise feature, so it's not in the open source version. But um, yeah, um, we call it um, um, uh, key management. Uh, so you can uh, basically connect out to the cloud provider and manage the lifecycle of those keys. What's really cool about it is, uh, say you're like a big Fortune 500 company or something like that, you're using a cloud provider. Chances are you are bringing your own keys, right? And uh, you know, you're going to have a bunch of data up there and you might be using a, a bunch of different keys for different, uh, you know, types of data or, and all of a sudden when you're managing hundreds of keys and, uh, you know, in a cloud environment, it becomes extremely cumbersome to figure out 
uh, you know, the life cycle and what version of keys. And you can uh, basically get Vault to manage all of that for you. So uh, it's sort of a remote control uh, as sort of the way I like to think about it, of like, um, you know, the, the cloud provider KMS. If you just search for, you know, Vault uh, ADP key management, uh, you'll you'll see it there. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so there's a question here of, hey, do DB admins or DBAs, um, you know, fall within sort of the dynamic credentials use case? Um, or should they be using something like uh, Boundary? Yeah, so I think it's sort of uh, could go both ways. Uh, you could, so Boundary is sort of, um, you know, uh, maybe I'll answer on the Vault side and then I'll chat about uh, Boundary for a second. So. 100%, uh, you could, uh, the use case for DBAs falls within dynamic credentials. It's really anyone. Hey, I'm a sysadmin. Hey, I'm a DBA. I need a, a, a dynamic credential. I need a credential to like log into this database and actually do something. So Vault is a perfect uh, way of doing that. And that, hey, you can log in to Vault using your LDAP credentials or whatever SSO provider you're using. Hey, generate me a credential to like go log into this system. Uh, that's awesome. Um, uh, however, we also have something called HashiCorp Boundary, which is a tool that gives you secure remote access. Uh, uh, Boundary is basically a way of, hey, I have a database instance uh, deep inside a cloud provider somewhere, and I probably don't have a direct path to go and connect to it. Maybe I'm going to have to go through some uh, you know, SSH bastion host. Maybe I have to connect to a VPN, whatever. Uh, Boundary is a product we have where uh, basically, you can configure it for your environment and you can use a client to, to basically proxy your connection through all those various networks to get to your destination. Um, and then you can do credential injection of, hey, uh, I want to connect to the system and I also want you to inject this credential so I don't need to care about what the credential is. Uh, I'd say on the vault side, we don't think about how you get to the system. We're just giving you the credential and how you get there is up to you. Uh, boundary sort of solves that problem of how you get to that system. So uh, hopefully that sort of explains the two use cases there. I think I got to all the questions. Uh, so thanks very much for um, hanging out on the call and um, hopefully you enjoy uh, Vault 1.12. If you, I will probably just follow up that, oops, uh, there's these two resources. The blog has all the links uh, and uh, learn.hashicorp.com. Uh, website has uh, basically all the tutorials. So thanks very much. And I'll pass it back to Kaylee. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for the presentation. And we appreciate everyone who answered or who asked questions. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, this webinar is recorded. So we'll be sending out the recording to everyone that registered within one to two days. And then you can also find the recording on our YouTube page. So we appreciate you joining and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, y'all.